Mountain View? There's some lights. That'll work. I'm so used to the bright light, I can't, I can't preach without them. It's like, come on. I'm so glad that you guys said that I'm coming out today, and I can see by the room here. I'm probably speaking to people over in the Worship Cafe as well, so thank you for joining us online down in Orange Family. We love you. For those brand new today, welcome. Thanks for taking the risk of coming out. We've been walking this summer uh, through the Old Testament book of Hosea. Not an easy task at all. The prophecy given by God to Hosea to the ten tribes that made up the northern kingdom of Israel. It had been split by that point in Israel and Judah in the south. We're picking up in a, in a challenging chapter. Of course, it would be chapter 13. I just thought about that just a second ago. Thinking, of course, it would be the challenging chapter uh, with the number 13. But I thought to myself, as I want to start this way, the people, the people had chosen their desires, their fantasies, their pleasures over the plans and purposes of God. They've rejected the plans of God for their own worthless idols. We were just singing that song about us. And that kind of hits really close to home because I'm not just talking about Israel thousands of years ago. I could be talking about us today. The challenge is it didn't have to be that way and it doesn't have to be that way today. But when we reject God our, as our hope, there's not much left. And that's what we're going to find out as we walk through this chapter today. When or if we choose to reject God as our hope, there's not a whole lot left. And in Hosea, the 13th chapter, the very first verse, he begins this way as he continues to speak to Israel. When Ephraim spoke, people trembled. He was exalted in Israel, but he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now, we've been talking about Ephraim being synonymous with Israel. Ephraim was a tribe, okay, but it began with one person. His name was Ephraim. Ephraim, Manasseh, his brother, they were the sons of Joseph. Remember, Joseph sold into slavery, grew up in Egypt, became second in command, had an Egyptian wife, had these children by her. But when the family in Palestine was reunited once together, Jacob brought and adopted them into the family And on that amazing day when they came to be blessed by their grandfather, Jacob, and of course Manasseh was the older and he was at the right hand because the right hand always got the blessing. And here goes Ephraim on the other side. In that amazing chapter in 48 in Genesis where Jacob crossed his hands and he put the hand of blessing upon the younger son, Ephraim. Why? Because there were plans and purposes for this young boy's life. And one day he would become the most powerful tribe of the 10 tribes of Israel in the northern kingdom. Unfortunately, as we read the scripture this morning, Ephraim became sick with sin and died, choosing pleasure over purpose. And it's not just, oh, one and done. Yeah, we're all there. We all sin. We're sinners according to the scripture. We understand our fallen flesh. But Hosea said these words to Israel. You just didn't sin once. He said this, verse 2, Now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifices. They kiss calf idols. Now you think, I don't even understand half of that. What are they doing? But for me, when I read this and began to study it, this was the moment everybody has them when they listen to some of their podcasts or me preach, or I'm listening to another preacher, you have those aha moments. This was one for me. It was kind of the wake up America, wake up church. Mark, you better wake up as you were typing this sermon out. And Kurt, I, would, I believe the same for you. The further God's people got away from God, this was chapter one of Hosea, you were ruined for lack of knowledge. That's where he starts off. We'll talk more about that in a couple weeks in a different context. But the further we get away from God, the more pronounced our idolatry becomes. It happened in Israel. It happens in my life. It'll happen in a nation. I believe it's not in the scripture. I just believe it's there. Test it. Disagree with it if you want to. But I believe there's a direct correlation between distance to God or from God and devotion. Two Ds, distance and devotion. Let me help you understand why I come that way. I believe the greater the distance from God, the greater our devotion will be to our idols. The further you and I get away from God, the closer we're going to get to our idols. The further we run from the purposes of God, which we put distance between us and God, the more we're going to seek our pleasure. The more we reject the character of God, the more satisfied we're going to become with our false comforters. 
And the more we reject the word of God, the more we're gonna delight in wickedness. I see the correlation myself. I see it in the church. It's easy to see nationally as we watch the news. I believe there is a direct correlation between distance and devotion. Matter of fact, the Bible says they even got to the point distancing themselves from God so much that they would profane God and offer human sacrifice. Now, do you think when God put his people together, brought them out of Egypt, he said, you know, I'm gonna love you, but if you wanna kill yourself, go right ahead. That never happened. When God brought his people together, he gave them the Levitical law. If you read through the book of Leviticus, he said, this is what a, a people that live honoring me does and what they don't do. In Leviticus 18, 21, he'd put this out there. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to the Canaanite god, Molech. For you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Now what got my attention in this was the word profane. Because it's easy to take God's name in vain. We've all done that at some point. I can't say we all, but many of us, myself included. I have repented of that one. But I thought to myself, profane. God is to be exalted, correct? That's what we want. We come to, why do we worship why do we stand up? Why do we have musicians? We come and lift up the name of God and exalt him in our hearts and minds to the proper place that he is and that he belongs in our lives. But in Israel, where the one true God is exalted, the firstborn children were consecrated to God. They literally were taken to the priests. They were sanctified. They were set apart as unto the Lord. Now, yeah, they brought their children back. Most of them did. No, you're not dropping your kids off at church today and leaving them here. But they would take them to the priest. They'd be consecrated. They would actually redeem them back from the priest for five sex shekels of silver, raise their own children. But they always remember, God, this is a gift from you. And I lift up my child before you, oh God. So here's what I thought. Distance and devotion. The further you get away from the God, the more we wander in wickedness. And I realized that where God is exalted, not just Israel, I'm gonna talk about your heart my heart, the schools, our nation, where God is exalted, children are consecrated, not exterminated. Process, distance, and devotion. I'm not talking about Israel. I'm talking about us. Abortion, neglect. Read the story on the news feed this week of the woman. It got to be mental health issues. Trapped her, one of her daughters there in the cage underneath of the, for a year, underneath of the staircase in the home and told the other kids if police ever come by, tell them she ran off to the woods to get eaten by wolves. True story, abuse, all the things going on today, abortion, sex trafficking, gender affirming care for minors, teachers, you can't tell the parents and doctors one to mutilate children. I started thinking about this going through it going, folks, this isn't just child abuse. All the things we're talking about, it's not just the worship of God. What's the opposite of the word of God? The opposite of the worship of the one true God is paganism. And what is paganism? What's the root of paganism? The occult. The rulers, the principalities, and the forces of this dark world, that's under paganism. We're either going to draw close to God or we're going to distance ourselves from Him. It's one or the other. There's no room in between. And Hosea went on to say to Israel, because they were in the middle of this, that if they persisted in their sin, there would only be one outcome. And he had this verse that really kind of, it's kind of the root of everything else I'm going to share today. This is what he said. Therefore, they, that's Israel, the people of God, they will be more like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears, like chaff swirling from the threshing floor, like smoke escaping through the window. Now, I'm not a person that learns well by reading. I'm a word picture person. So I just went to Google. I grabbed the pictures and I put them in an art form and then I just stared at it and said, God, what are you trying to say to me? What is mist? Particles of water suspended in the atmosphere. What is dew? Condensed particles of water in the atmosphere that now lands on an object. What is chaff? The outer shell of the, of the husk that through the threshing, the windowing process comes off of corn or other seed. What is smoke? Particles of dirt or, not dirt or debris that's been burned that's suspended in the atmosphere. And I sat there and looked at it and said, Hosea said this to Israel. What do these have in common for you and me today? What don't they have? Footing, foundation, moorings, connection. In an instant, the sun can come up and the radiated heat can eliminate the mist and the dew. 
A gentle breeze can come by, and there goes the smoke, and there goes the chaff. In an instant, no, no grounding, no footing. What did Jesus say, when, as Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament in Ephesians, he said, I desire, I, he prayed over the church, he said, I desire that you be rooted, not that, rooted and established, anybody know what it said? In love, the love of God. <laughs> Jesus himself said in John 15, as he spoke to the disciples, remain in me, rooted in me, Remain in me and I in you. Abide in me, some translations say, and I in you. And you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's where we are today. And that's where they were at that time. And so I thought, okay, remember what he said. But I have been the Lord your God. It's I think the verse four. Go ahead and put that up there if you would. But I have been the Lord your God since you came out of Egypt. There was the root for Israel. Never forget where you came from. But I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me. No Savior except me. This was the moorings. This was the anchor. I talked about it last week. This is a, not a repeat, but it was in the next chapter as well. That in the preamble to the Ten Commandments, remember I shared for those who were here, that God said through the scripture in those moments that remember I am that God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's the footer. That's the foundation you hold to. And then I thought to myself, wait a second, that's not the only time I've heard something like that. I started thinking about when the kings came along and Israel, 10 northern tribes, had their very first king, King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam was in the occult, kind of like he's in the pagan worship. He was trying to be in the worship of the one true God. And so he made those golden calves and he tried to blend them into worship, kind of like what people try to do today. And at one point in scripture, now remember the scripture you just heard. This is what he did and said to the people of Israel on one occasion. He said this. He lifted up the golden calves and he said, Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Really? I could have sworn that God just said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And what I understand to be true, when you put that statement together with the other statement, only one of them can be true. Only one can be true. And we have to make a choice at that moment. But when I thought of that word choice, I realized, ah, Mark, never forget this. Distance and devotion. If we don't choose to stay connected to God. I'm not simply just talking about sitting in church on Sunday. That is a part of what we do. I'm not, but when we choose not to stay connected to God, I think there's only one other option. We will make our own gods. We will try to become our own God. And from that point, we move from being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ to nothing but do that evaporates and disappears quickly. That happens to individuals. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. It could happen to churches. And we see it everywhere. In verse 5 and 6, he reminds them of this. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. He was reminding them of their history. When I fed them, they were satisfied when they were satisfied, they became proud, and then they forgot me. He could be writing that letter to us today. And so I'm going through, and I'm processing through that. I remember that Nate Byer was standing on the stage a couple of weeks ago, and he made a comment about, you know, oftentimes we forget the blesser. We run after the blessing. I've done it. You do it. And I can hear God saying these weren't words in Scripture. I was putting a narrative together in my head, and suddenly I just started thinking, I like it. I just started typing it as I was writing it, thinking in my head. And I thought, you know, God's almost saying to Israel, Hey, Israel, you remember when we were first dating? I mean, that time before you got into all that Baal worship and everything? You remember when we had that falling out in the wilderness and you had to take 40 laps around Sinai? Yeah, you remember that? I want you to remember, Israel, I never left you. Morning, noon, and night I was there. I was there in the pillar of cloud in the day. I was there in the pillar of fire at night. I never abandoned you. I satisfied every need you had with food and drink, but when you came into the land that I gave you, you became prosperous, you became self-satisfied, you became self-serving, and you left your heart open to manipulation. I don't have to talk about Israel anymore, I can talk about us. And using the analogy of a couple of weeks, I thought to myself that when we become separated from the Lord, that adversary, that enemy that is behind all things paganism, 
will put in front of you and me a buffet of things to choose from, and we just start gobbling it up. Why? Because our hearts we left open to manipulation when we live as dew and mist and chaff and smoke. And that's what was happening to Israel. But they wouldn't listen. Remember, they said, I've been the Lord. Remember, God said, I've been the Lord your God since you came out of Egypt. They wouldn't listen to him. In verse 7 and 8, he says these words. Go ahead and pass that one. So I will be like a lion to them. Like a leopard, I will lurk by the path. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Now, you think, okay, a lot of animal analogies here. Remember that God is sovereign. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He sees everything from beginning to end, right? God knows all. Understand, he's saying this. He's talking about the future for Israel. When you look at these pictures, you talk about a lion. You go into the prophecy of Daniel in the seventh chapter of Daniel. He uses that image of lion to speak of the great empire called Babylon. One day they would take over Israel. When he talked about the leopard, he talked about Alexander the Great in the great Greek empire. One day they would come and conquer as well. The Medes and the Persians he was referring to, and he's not referring to Cyrus the Great at the time, that Cyrus the Great would come at some point. But right now the Mede and the Persian empire was dominated by the Assyrians, and he used the analogy of the bear. If you ever watch National Geographic, I don't recommend it, when a mother bear is robbed of her cubs. I mean, it's horrific what she will do to anyone and anything. And what that refers to is the brutality of the Assyrian army that was coming to destroy Israel. And it's hard for us to think about that because oftentimes Jesus, or the Lord, is pictured as a shepherd to his people. And many times when we get into trouble, we want to blame God. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. God, why would you let this happen? Why, do God, does this happen to me? I'm really glad this very next verse was in the scripture and I will never forget it. One of the stories, I didn't remember it was there, but I'll never forget it now. And I'm glad because every time I want to be tempted to ask why, God, you let this happen to me, especially if it's something I've been doing, this is what he said to Israel. You are destroyed, Israel, because who? You are against me, against your helper. Where's your king that he may save you? Where are your rulers in all your towns of whom you said, give me a king and princesses? So in my anger, I gave you a king, and in my wrath, I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept on record. Can't speak for you. But so oftentimes, we want to blame God for when things happen, but God's saying this situation, Israel, you destroyed yourself. Don't blame me for this. You destroyed yourself. I looked up another translation of this very word and said, you have destroyed yourself, and you're responsible for your own condition. Sometimes we have to own our own junk. My wife tells me that's a mantra. She says, Mark, own your own junk. And it's true. We have to own it. They had rejected God as their helper. A lot of times in our marriage ministry, we talk about the, the wife being given to a man, a godly man, as a helpmeet. And in our culture, we don't like that. I don't need somebody's helper. I'm my own person. Don't talk that language. I don't want any part of it. But God himself brought himself down to be the helper of Israel. Ezer is the word. I think I'm pronouncing that right. In Hebrew, if I'm wrong, somebody knows it better. Please correct me later. Not now. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But I looked it up to see, what does it mean? I don't even think a marriage ministry ever looked it up. Protection, guidance, and blessing. Then I started thinking about my wife. Isn't a godly woman in our lives protection able to bring guidance and certainly a blessing? Yeah. So why not God in those moments? How many in this room would say, I, I desire the protection of God? Anybody? I desire the guidance of God. We, Nate was on the stage talking about the land behind us. I've been praying over that for a long time and saying, God, this is of you. And we're praying as a church, God, is that land behind us a part of our next 20 years of history? That's all I'm praying. Would you show us, Lord, would you give us guidance if we are to move forward, talking to the landlord? How do we do it? That would honor you and bless them and bless the church. I don't know how to do this. But God, you already know what's going to happen. 
That's what we ask people to pray. God says, I desire to be your helper. And that's where I see the image of the boundless love of God coming from when I get in the scripture because God's incomparable love is demonstrated again and again in his willingness to help sinners. Israel, Mountain View, Mark Jenkins, put your name there for a moment. God has not stopped offering his help to any one of us who will call on him. But hear me loud and clear. This was the ah, God's like, I tell you, I won't be able to get past this. But here's the problem. Midst, not midst, mist, dew, chaff, and smoke are not reaching out for God's help. The distance is growing and the pursuit of the idolatrous is in front of them. And that becomes their false comforters and their false Eden. That might be you. It could be me. And in that moment, I recognize, folks, it, we have to stop. Some, you may say, that's me right now. I'm more do than am daughter of God. I'm more chaff than I'm tr- child of God. I'm more myths than man of God. And maybe you need to stop right now and say, God, that picture owns me. But it doesn't have to define me for the rest of my life. I can repent and turn to you and get connected. Why do we come to church? Why do we invite people to life groups? Why do we invite people to ministry teams? It's connection with the Lord and with each other. We all need each other. A couple years ago, I said to my wife, I have to stay connected in life groups. We have to do this. It can be very isolating. You have to stay connected. And so, as I get ready to turn this over to Orange in just a moment, I want to just say this one last thing. We need to be careful. Because one of the things prophecy taught me in this moment was the hope in the Lord is not, the hope that God desires to give us is not unlimited. Now, I'm not a heretic. Stick with me for just a second. There will be consequences for sin ultimately. And before I get to that, I'm going to turn this over to the host in orange. God, you can take it from here. I'm going to help the family here and those online to understand what I mean by that. In verse 13 of chapter 13, he says these words. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. This is the boundless love of God. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? Now understand, this is the beauty in this moment. I desire to do this for you. Matter of fact, I think that was an earlier verse. I just realized, will you go back to verse 13 for a second? Pains as of a woman in childbirth come to him. But he's a child without wisdom. When the time arrives, he doesn't have the sense to come out of the womb. Now we know historically, and I hope nobody knows anybody that's ever walked through that. If you get a situation back in history, you know, we didn't have the technology today that if a baby was breached or had struggles and the woman would labor and labor for days on end and eventually what would happen if the baby couldn't be born? The baby would die often and a mother would die too. Israel was dying because they didn't have the sense to be born into what God had the plans and purposes for them. And oftentimes we think of ourselves, you know, as a matter of fact, let me go to, it was in 2 Kings, it was actually King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, when Judah, the Babylonian Empire, was coming upon them, King Hezekiah had the same feelings, the same kind of words, except he was smart enough to do something that the other king didn't. And Kings, he said, they told him because Hezekiah sent a delegation to the prophet Isaiah. What do we do? This is what Hezekiah said. This day, this was Judah, the southern kingdom. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace as when children come to the moment of birth and there's no strength to deliver them. We sing the song, God is our, God is our strength. But when we come midst and chaff and do disconnect from him, we don't even have the strength anymore to turn. We don't even have the desire as well. And I thought it was a nation. I, it's not picky. I love the United States of America. And thank God he allowed me to grow up here. But I thought to myself, when we come into a national crisis many times, where do we turn first? Remember, what did this king get? He turned to the prophet. What do we do? I thought, what do we often do? To we turn to the experts. Turn to the PhDs and the scholars, the scientists, m- medical person. That's fine. Where's God in all that? Where's a nation are returning to him, God? What do we do in this moment? 
And I thought to myself, Mountain View, talking about right here today, I often wonder to myself, how many visions, how many dreams, how many endeavors, how many new ministries, how many projects has God planted as seeds in your heart and mind, developing, growing like a child in a mother's womb? But we're living more as myths than men of God, more as do than daughters of God, more as chaff than children of God. We're disconnected from him and we have no strength of the spirit to deliver into this world that new ministry or that new endeavor, that new NGO, whatever it may be. We don't have it. And how many times the visions die and the ministries die and the church plants die and the NGOs die. And you get the idea. And then I had this thought come across my mind. I thought, well, I'm going to run with it. I believe that God Almighty is the greatest OBGYN that ever existed. He's mastered deliverance, amen? I mean, many of us are sitting here because we're saved and sanctified by the Spirit of God and the blood of Jesus Christ from the cross of Calvary. I recognize analogies break down somewhere and there could be some women and some pain here and so forgive me, I don't want to cause hardship on anyone, but I do know a God who can deliver us from sin and shame and death and bondage and addiction. That's a God that I know. That's a God that I worship. And that's where God could say in Hosea 13, 14 to 16, maybe some of the most horrific verses in the Old Testament that most people don't even want to read is kind of want to clip it out. But the very first word is something to hold on to. As much sin as Israel had in them. Maybe as much sin as you have in your life and sin I have in mine. God said, I'm faithful. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And then we hear the words of the New Testament in 1 Corinthians. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? I have no... And see, there's the good. That's the boundless love. But there is consequences for sin. And he said the words, I will have no compassion even though he thrives among his brothers. And east wind, he's referring about the Assyrian Empire. An east wind from the Lord will come, blowing in from the desert. His springs will fail and his wells dry up. His storehouses will be plundered of all its treasures. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open no one wants to read that the sheer first I thought the sheer devastation that our sin brings upon herself and those around us but between services today God put a picture in my eyes I live by pictures those very last words as horrific as the murder of a pregnant mother Suddenly I realized the devastation, the loss of potential. You, when you work, and I've worked with grieving moms and dads who've lost children. Yes, it's hard enough to lose a child, but what I often hear is all the loss of the potential of the future. All the things they look forward to. Do you not think that God grieved over Israel when the Assyrians were destroying them? All the potential they had in front of them, lost because of sin. Folks, we have a God who loved you and me enough to send Messiah Jesus into the world, that he would take upon himself that horrific death. You talk about the ripping open, okay, I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. I'm gonna bring it up anymore. You get the analogy. All that wrath that Assyria brought on Egypt for sin, God sent that upon his son, perfect as he was, so that you and I could walk in the grace and the mercy that is ours today. The scripture says at the end, I close with this, in scripture in Corinthians 15, go ahead and put it up. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Christ's victory on the cross that is, the most, that is the ultimate OBGYN moment, the greatest deliverance in human history. 
God delivers us from sin and shame and guilt. He plants us upon a rock, the psalmist says, a rock that is higher than I. And think about all the potential in your life, all that God has planted within you. He desires to see be birthed to fruition. But not if we're more myths than men of God. Not if we're more do than daughters of the king. We have to confess and repent and once again connect ourselves to the stream of living water, he said, out of which you will bow and bear forth all types of fruit. That's his promise to us. Hard chapter, but just tingling with promise. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me for a moment. God, I have no idea what you wanna do with that. It was hard to prepare, it's hard to preach, but it's your beautiful, unadulterated, inerrant word, Every word is true. You desire us to hear it, understand it, process it. Father, maybe there's some in this room right now who would say to themselves that they were brutally honest. I am certainly more chaff than child of God. I am certainly more due than daughter of the king. I'm certainly more midst than man of God. And if that is you and you profess faith in Jesus Christ, then I encourage you as I've been doing, I encourage you right where you sit. Those online, it's the same thing. I encourage you to confess that sin that is drawing your heart further and further away. Remember, distance and devotion. The enemy is always trying to draw us away from the Lord, knowing that what will replace it will be something of paganism. Always has been, always will be. So if you find yourself drifting, cry out to Jesus to clasp and grab your hand as Peter crying as he fell into the sea Lord help me knowing that he's there Father if you're faithful bless Lord this congregation I pray for those who don't know you if you're sitting in this room today and you hunger for a relationship with Christ I encourage you right where you sit today say Lord I want you in my life Jesus I proclaim by faith that you are the son of God I wasn't there when you were born, but I believe your word. And I accept you in my life today. Take away my sin. Root me to the Father. Ground me to the Lord and to the Spirit that will live in me. That what comes from my life in the weeks and months and days ahead will be fruit of righteousness and not the rot of paganism. Father, thank you for your truths. 